Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, launch webinar for the new Building Momentum Report, Establishing Robust Policies to Promote Physical Activity in Primary Healthcare Settings. My name is Dr. Kate Allen. I'm the Science and Policy Advisor at the World Cancer Research Fund International. And as you may know, WCRF International focuses on cancer prevention and survival through diet, weight and physical activity. And we know from our own research and also that of others that physical activity is, is very strongly protective against a range of different cancer types. And we also know that it helps to um, protect against weight gain. And of course, that in itself is very important in terms of the very strong link between obesity and many different kinds of cancer. So because of its importance in, in cancer prevention, um, one of our 10 WCRF cancer prevention recommendations focuses on physical activity. So the Building Momentum report that you're going to be hearing about today is the latest in a series of reports. And as the name suggests, they are designed to build momentum in a particular area and to help um, policymakers to um, to overcome barriers in implementing evidence-based policy. And the sorts of policy areas that we're interested in at WCRF, you won't be surprised to hear, are around nutrition and physical activity. And that's because we want to be able, through policy action, to help create enabling environments that make it easier for people to follow our cancer prevention recommendations and thereby have a, a healthier life. So previous building momentum reports have all focused on the nutrition side of things. Um, we've had one on um, sugary drinks taxation, one on front of pack labeling, um, one on the restriction of unhealthy marketing to uh, food and drinks to children. And this report, um, as, as you know, is focusing on physical activity. But a common thread through all of the reports is that they, they feature stories, narratives, um, examples from, from different countries on what works um, from a policy perspective and, and what doesn't. And that's been developed through interviews with people kind of on the ground in different countries who are helping to effect policy change in their countries. And a bit later in the webinar, we're going to be hearing from two speakers, one from Sweden and one from the UK, um, from a government and a health professional background respectively, who will be talking about um, their national perspectives. But before we, we do that, um, I'm going to introduce our WCRF International Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Kendra Chow, and she'll give a, a kind of top line overview of the main points of the report. Um, but just before she does, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. So first of all, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available afterwards um, on demand. And then also you can post questions or comments during the webinar in the Q&A. And if it's possible, if you have a question for a particular person, if you could um, preface your comment with their name you know, for Kendra and then your question, for example. Um, so now I really am going to um, hand over to, to Kendra to give us um, an overview of the report. So thank you very much and over to you, Kendra. Thank you, Kate. So as Kate mentioned, uh, my name is Kendra Chow, and I will be providing a report overview for our fourth Building Momentum report, Establishing Robust Policies to Promote Physical Activity in Primary Healthcare. So why is physical activity important in tackling cancer and other NCDs? WCRF International has determined that there is a strong evidence that physical activity reduces the risks of developing several types of cancer, including breast and colon cancers. It also helps to prevent and manage other NCDs, including cardiovascular disease, like heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, COPD, and hypertension. Physical activity can also help prevent disease progression and improve quality of life. It also helps to maintain a healthy body weight and protects against overweight and obesity. This, in turn, also helps to reduce the risk of developing cancer and other NCDs. The number of persons living with overweight and obesity has been a policy concern in high-income countries for some time now and is becoming increasingly concerning in low- and middle-income countries as well. So as we can see from the figure, physical activity also provides many other health benefits in addition to these items, including improving musculoskeletal health, better sleep, and many mental health benefits. 
The WHO recommends that adults should do at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, or at least 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity, excuse me. They also recommend that adults should also do strength training activities at least two days a week. Global estimates indicate that 28% of adults and over 80% of adolescents are not meeting WHO recommended physical activity levels. In 2013, all WHO member states agreed to target a 10% relative reduction in insufficient physical activity by 2025. And in recognizing the significant link between physical activity and NCDs, they then increased this target to a 15% reduction for adults and adolescents by 2030. However, if current trends continue, the chances of reaching this target seem slim. As we can see from the figure, in 2016, the global average not meeting global physical activity recommendations was 27.5%. We can also see that rates of physical inactivity increased in both high and low income countries between 2001 and 2016. The impacts of physical inactivity go beyond health impacts for individuals. The healthcare and lost productivity costs due to NCDs are substantial. The WHO Global Status Report on Physical Activity suggests that globally, almost 500 million new cases of preventable NCDs will occur between 2020 and 2030. The WHO report also estimates that about three quarters of these new cases would occur in low and middle income countries. This is tremendously expensive. The report estimates that the diagnosis, treatment, and management of new cases of NCDs currently cost 27.4 billion US dollars annually. This is also likely to be a significant underestimate of the actual costs, as it does not account for indirect costs to society, such as reduced productivity at work. Policies, laws, regulations, and guidelines are important tools that governments can use to create environments that encourage physical activity. Action needs to be taken across a wide range of areas, so areas such as health, sport, education, transport, and urban design to target where we live, learn, work, and play. Trends showing the use of national policy protocols as seen in this figure here. On the management of physical activity in primary care, uh, we've divided that up by WHO regions between in 2019 and 2021, show that there are some increases, but also there have been some decreases in these programs. So we really need to be doing more in our policy realm to reach our global targets. Uh, additionally, if you are interested in more information about globally implemented policy actions, including those that uh, use a cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach, I encourage you to check out our WCRF International's Moving Framework and Database. So it's really important to note that there's no one single policy solution to encouraging physical activity. A whole system cross-sectoral approach is required. The importance of this whole policy, sorry, the whole system approach is clearly set out in WHO's Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. What uh, GAPA sets out is four policy strategic objectives to create active societies, environments, people, and systems. Its policy recommendations include the promotion of physical activity in primary health care, and targets for increasing physical activity will only be achieved with the involvement and coordination of a range of stakeholders, including government, local and national, NGOs, the health system, academia, the media, and the public. So why primary health care? Primary health care professionals include GPs, nurses, dietitians, physiotherapists, and others. They are typically the first point of contact for medical care for the population, which in turn gives primary healthcare professionals greater access to the population across the life course. Since primary healthcare professionals and clinics are often embedded in their communities, they are more likely to be more aware of or have developed connections to local physical activity opportunities. The evidence has shown that primary healthcare interventions such as screening, brief advice, and referral have led to increased levels of physical activity. So this does work. What are the benefits for physical activity promotion in primary health care? For health, the body of evidence is consistently increasing. As mentioned, brief interventions, prescription, or referrals have been shown to lead to a sustained uptake of physical activity, important to note sustained uptake, and can result in positive changes in health outcomes for patients who are inactive and at risk for developing NCDs. Financially, evidence is growing for primary care interventions providing value for money and having returns on investment. 
implementation of sustained population-wide promotion of physical activity with links to community-based programs is one of the WHO and CD Best Buys that was most recently updated at the 76th World Health Assembly in May. It is estimated that if minimum WHO guidelines on physical activity were achieved, this would lead to a global gross GDP in increase worth up to $446 billion per year. In developing and implementing policies to promote physical activity in primary care, there are several roadblocks and potential barriers to consider, as is shown here. And I'm sure many of you who are joining us today are familiar with or have encountered these in your own work. So in our Building Momentum report, our review of the global literature and with stakeholder interviews that we conducted, we found that policies need to incorporate A, foundational policy processes based on a clear set of principles, and B, include a necessary set of components to address potential barriers to adoption on the ground. So first, I'll go through the foundational policy processes. So first and foremost, policies need to be evidence-based. You need to use the evidence. And they should also be informed by lived experience of patients or advocacy group. A second uh, foundational policy process is building shared policy understanding and objective. So ensuring a whole government understanding of the benefits of physical activity promotion in primary health care can foster broad political support for policy across government departments, building a shared understanding that policy is feasible and beneficial. Our next speaker is Kate Mention. Irene Nilsson Carlson will also speak to the development of a national physical activity promotion program in Sweden that was developed from cross-governmental engagement and support just like this. It's also really important to engage in cross-sectoral collaboration. It's really essential. A really good example of this is the National Exercise Referral Scheme in Wales, where an evaluation concluded that the key to success was early collaboration between government researchers, policy leads, and independent evaluators to develop and facilitate the program, along with regular meetings between local coordinators, evaluators, and national policymakers. So that cross-sectoral collaboration is crucial. Context matters. Policy should take into account healthcare system models, political context, social, and cultural realities into account. A really great example of taking context into account and successfully increasing engagement with physical activity is the Jamaica Moves program, which has now been expanded to the Caribbean Moves program. Jamaica's Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Christopher Tufton, has emphasized that what the program does is gets individuals to enjoy themselves in a healthier way. He has said Caribbean Moves is about having fun, enjoying your culture, enjoying your history, enjoying your identity, but doing it in moderation. They host Move Your Body uh, dance days and community events that offer healthy food and beverage options alongside physical activity engagement. And finally, the fourth uh, foundational policy process is equity. Advancing equity should be a consideration at every stage of policymaking from design through to the implementation and evaluation. Policymakers must consider the upstream determinants of health when designing policy to improve health equity in tandem with the promotion of physical activity in primary health care. Well-designed policy on physical activity should help contribute to improving and not widening health inequities. It is essential that policymakers invite and engage with the expertise, insights, and active participation of various policy stakeholders, particularly those representing vulnerable populations who may be disproportionately affected by existing policies. So, and now moving on to the components for effective policies. So what the components are, they are key components of policy that can overcome the identified barriers to policy implementation and practice. Without the appropriate practical support and knowledge, primary healthcare professionals will not be able to consistently and effectively deliver physical activity promotion. The policy environment must provide primary healthcare professionals with the training that they need, as well as the practical capacity to incorporate it into their everyday workload and practice. So these components include primary healthcare professional training, beginning at school for physicians and allied health professionals, and continuing through, regular, through readily available professional development training modules. Training builds expertise and confidence amongst primary healthcare professionals, and it also has the added benefit that well-trained, confident, enthusiastic professionals also inspire trust amongst their patients, as well as to follow the physical activity advice that they are given. Health systems capacity also needs to be considered. 
This includes ensuring that health systems are with that primary health care workers operate within provides them with the time, tools, and incentives for physical activity promotion to take place, and to also enable monitoring and evaluation to assess the impact of the policy on levels of physical activity. The third component is incentives. These can be used to help increase rates of delivery and uptake amongst patients. Incentives can include professional body regulations or financial mechanisms, and also support for voluntary actions by primary healthcare professionals. And next, we have communication and collaborative approaches are needed to ensure that policies are applicable and relevant to primary healthcare practitioners, their practice, and the patients for whom they are providing care. When everyone is aware of the benefits of physical activity, this can be a really powerful incentive to collaborate. Coordination within and beyond health, the health sector can help to prevent duplication of services and wasted resources. We found that in low resource settings, particularly, collaboration with existing programs or certified exercise professionals from the community can be particularly effective. And supportive environments for patients are necessary as well. To fully enable a whole systems approach to physical activity promotion, policies must effectively extend to where we live, learn, work, and play. This should include supportive built environments with considerations for safety, accessibility, and health inequities. Our second speaker, Dr. William Bird, will speak to his experience with these components, such as enhancing primary health care professional training, capacity, and confidence, as well as creating supportive environment initiatives in the UK. So our web annexes, in addition to the main body of the report, supplementary annexes provide additional information. In Annex 1, it provides detailed snapshots of the policy state of play in WCRF international network countries of the Netherlands, United States, and United Kingdom, including England, Scotland, and Wales. Annex 2 provides an overview of international policy recommendations and guidance. And then Annex 3 covers a broad typology of ways in which policy can be implemented in primary health care and practice. So in summary, there is positive and growing evidence for the benefits of policies that promote physical activity in primary health care, including helping with decreasing the risk of developing cancer and other NCDs. To reach our global targets on physical inactivity, we need to be doing more globally. Designing and enacting such policies is good for individual health and for economies, as is demonstrated by its inclusion as one of the WHO's best buys. Key issues and potential barriers to adoption can be addressed by designing and implementing policies that engage with the identified foundational policy processes and incorporating essential policy components for effective uptake and delivery in primary health care. In the report, you'll also find many more examples from countries that I was not able to mention today that provide an example of the policy state of play globally. So overall, engaging with the findings in the fourth Building Momentum report will enable governments and health systems to enact well-designed policy on physical activity promotion in primary health care. And I'm sure you've noticed already, but we do have the QR code on screen as well for you to download the Building Momentum report from our website, now available. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And... Um, Yes, I hope you take a look at the report and see all the great work that is being done globally to advance work in this area. Thank you, Kendra. A very nice overview of the report, uh, especially the benefits of the physical activity in primary healthcare, those foundational policy processes that are so important and the components to include in the policy design. So that's been a, a hopefully a, a helpful kind of setting the scene and giving some context around the, the, the report in general. Um, so now we'll move on to look more at the national uh, perspective. Uh, first of all, we're going to focus on Sweden, and I'm very pleased to introduce Irene Nielsen Carlson. So Irene is the Senior Public Health Advisor at the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden, which works to ensure high quality health and social care for the Swedish population. And Irene's going to be presenting on progress towards the recent establishment of national physical activity promotion policies in Sweden. So um, over to you, Irene, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar and the launch of the report. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to participate. And uh, the National Board of Health and Welfare uh, that I re represent is a government agency under the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs in Sweden. 
and uh, we have a wide range of uh, duties to deal with. And uh, one of them is to support uh, knowledge-based uh, healthcare services to make uh, healthcare services also more equal distributed uh, all over the country. So that we will have the same quality for all people in Sweden and that the healthcare services will be provided according to the inhabitants' needs. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, then we uh, show uh, an example of the national guidelines that is a typical uh, uh, publication from, from the National Board of Health and Welfare that has a great impact uh, in the Swedish healthcare sector. Uh, and uh, the first national guidelines on prevention and treatment of unhealthy lifestyles were published already 2011, and uh, that uh, one included the recommendations on uh, uh, how to improve people's uh, physical activity uh, among people who are in insufficient uh, physical active. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, working with an uh, update of the guidelines. So there will be a new publication uh, next year uh, with an updated uh, with updated recommendations. Uh, and uh, the recommendations, the basis for the recommendations is uh, the the most effective way of counseling to support people to choose uh, uh, healthy lifestyles uh, and change their behavior in, in according to more healthy lifestyles. And then we can go to the next uh, slide. And that uh, shows uh, the Swedish uh, model for physical activity on prescription. And that one is uh, uh, developed uh, by a branch in the Swedish Society of uh, Medicine. Uh, so it, it's uh, mainly developed by health professionals. And uh, the center of the, med of the model is person-centered counseling. And that is uh, in line with the recommendations in the national guidelines from the agency. And uh, the the model also consists of written prescription, of course, but another part that is important is also the, the follow-up of uh, what is the impact of the, the written prescription and uh, the counselling, of course. Uh, and uh, to support the health staff in, in healthcare, uh, the branch uh, in the medical society also have, uh, have published an evidence-based knowledge uh, handbook. Uh, and uh, uh, that is partly uh, been uh, produced with support from, uh, from uh, government agencies in Sweden. And the, uh, the last part of the model is, of course, the, the cooperation with suppliers of activities. Uh, the most important is to support people who are uh, not very active today, and they might need uh, some guidance to find uh, the most appropriate activities for them. So the collaboration with the NGOs and, and other organizations that could, uh, could uh, uh, supply uh, uh, appropriate activities for, for the inhabitants is also an important part of, of the model. Then we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a picture of the FIS handbook. Uh, and uh, physical activity in the prevention and treatment of diseases is, is the, the headline. And it summarizes the up-to-date scientific knowledge on how to prevent and treat various diseases and conditions using physical activity. And uh, the handbook is especially tailored to be a tool for licensed healthcare staff when prescribing physical activity. 
So the content is a lot of, in one part of, of the handbook, you can find a lot of uh, diagnosis. And in connection with that, you can see uh, the, the recommendations. And uh, we can go to the next slide. And uh, there I have put in an example of, uh, and, and this one is physical activity in depression. And uh, this just to give an example of the content in, in FIS. And uh, it follows the same pattern for all uh, diagnosis. Uh, the first uh, section uh, includes uh, a description about uh, the, the diagnose, uh, and the, in this case, depression in uh, different ways. And then we have a uh, section on effects of physical activity and level of evidence. Uh, that is graded. And the third one is physical activity and pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's usual that you combine uh, recommendation of physical activity and also pharmaceuticals for, for many patients. And then uh, they also included examples of tools for assessing and evaluating effects of physical activity. And uh, in the end of each chapter, they recommend the physical activity. And in this case for depression, it's both aerobic physical activity and muscle strengthening physical activity. And they use the same concepts, intensity, duration, minutes per week, frequency and days per week. And for muscle strengthening, number of exercises, repetitions, set, frequency, and days per week. So this is an illustration to see why this is a, a task for healthcare services to deal with physical activity. And I think um, a lot of people who, who, who come to, to the healthcare service, they, they have some, some healthcare problems they want to uh, to, to be helped with, and uh, some uh, who, who have health problems could also be a bit worried about uh, what kind of physical activity, if, if none, is uh, appropriate with my kind of uh, health problem. And uh, there's also a, a high level of legitimate from uh, healthcare staff to, to uh, inspire the patient uh, in, uh, in an appropriate way, uh, what kind of activities is most uh, useful for, for you and uh, what kind of uh, side effects uh, do I need to avoid? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can go to the next slide. And uh, <clears throat> what's happened uh, now? We have a, a new government since uh, last autumn, and they have given an assignment to the National Board of Health and Welfare uh, to even more support increased prescribing and promote compliance to prescribe the FAR, as is the acronym in, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, in the assignment, uh, we uh, have to distribute grant uh, from government to regions. The, the, the regions are uh, the main uh, responsible for healthcare services in, in Sweden. And we should uh, reflect the scientific support for the method and ensure that the national recommendations are best, based on the best available knowledge. So that is something that we take on board when we are going through the, the current uh, national guidelines. And uh, we will give support to caregivers in the implementation and application of FAR. And uh, we have already produced uh, some uh, uh, pedagogic ma material and, and uh, web-based uh, uh, edu uh, training materials and so on, but uh, we will improve that work uh, further. And uh, we have also to investigate if and how to include physical activity as a reason for prescribing in the national information structure for documentation in medical records. And that is something 
that uh, also involve the e-health authority in Sweden. And uh, the last but not the least, that is that we also uh, have to follow up on the region's work with the implementation of, uh, of FAR. So uh, that will... Uh, uh, that, that will include a lot of work for how to, to make the documentation uh, more uh, equal al along all over the country and we need to build a better system to, to, uh, to, to get the data from the regions so we can provide better information on the implementation of FAR. So, and that was the last slide from me then thank you <laughs> thank you very much um Ari. it's very interesting to hear about the swedish experience and um how how you're incorporating prescription of physical activity in healthcare settings um so we're now going to move from um, sweden to the uk um and i'm very pleased to introduce dr william bird uh, William's a GP in the UK, and he's um, he's also an honorary professor at the University of, of Exeter on nature and health. Um, and William's the founder of Intelligent Health, which it aims to build healthier, active um, and more connected communities, helping people to make uh, small changes to daily behaviours, which then add up to big differences. So William's talking um, about the promoting physical activity uh, within primary healthcare settings um, in, in the UK. So I'm very pleased, William, to hand over to you. Thank you. A real pleasure to be here and thank you um, for inviting me and also for hearing the good work that's going on in Sweden, which we've always been looking at because of that, um, the, the FIS, the FYSS, when it first came out, it was the first time we managed to get all the information in one place about long-term conditions. So I've been trying to promote, and I say trying because it's hard, um, physical activity in primary care for over or about 30 years now. And I'm going to talk about two parts. One of them is about the government's way of trying to get um, primary care for professionals, so not just GPs, but nurses and physios and allied health professionals, about physical activity, the training um, on a national scale and where that's got to and, and the evaluation of that. And then I'm going to talk about the actual environment. How do we actually get the environments? But perhaps I'll just start um, with a story. When we had the 2012 Olympics in London, um, NHS London, the National Health Service in London, wanted to do something as a, a legacy. So they asked if I would go to two practices in every borough to talk about physical activity to the, to the GPs and nurses there. So I went all, I think, about 44 boroughs, et cetera, so 88 practices. And every time I went to a practice, I asked the doctors and the nurses, what are the current guidelines of physical activity for an adult? And by the time I got to number 88, I still hadn't heard the correct answer. There wasn't a single doctor or nurse in the whole of London of the places I went to who knew. That got reported back to government and the government called the Department of Health said, you've got to do something. This is terrible. We've got the Olympics, and yet no doctors or nurses know anything about the guidance. Hence, this program started. So if we start the first slide. Um, so what the MHPP is, Moving Healthcare Professionals, and it was set up to try and correct that, and not just in physical um, activity in primary care, but also in hospitals and undergraduates as well, to make sure it's embedded in the whole training process of all doctors and nurses. And what I kind of found very quickly is that you talk about physical activity, yes, it prevents cancer, it prevents heart disease, it prevents depression. You kind of get a kind of sight glazed over because they all say, we know that, you know, we, we know that. But there are two things they wanted to know. One of them is the science behind it. And the second thing is that actually, what can I do as a doctor with the patient in front of me? So from the science, I think one of the facts that came across very strongly is that weight loss is only 10% of the benefit of physical activity on health. It's the 90% is all about other parts in the brain, the anti-inflammatory, um, the BDNF in the brain, the way it regulates our immune system, um, the visceral fact that there's so many other elements. And it was always kind of the poorer relation to obesity um, and diet. 
So people kind of always put it that this was a way of losing weight. It does, of course, but actually that wasn't his key element. And once he got past that, they were much more attentive. Next slide. So background to the program, basically moving healthcare professionals, it was divided into these sections. The physical activity clinical champions, these were peer to peer. So these were doctors or nurses trained up to teach other doctors and nurses going into their GP practice, doing it online. The Moving Medicine was a website which was um, directed at the University of Oxford and the Faculty of Sports and um, Exercise Medicine, very designed for people doing clinic, clinic, saying, if I've got one minute, how can I get that message across? Active Hospitals was really trying to embed physical activity across the entire structure of the hospital and all the, all the care pathways. Um, there was e-learning on the GPs and the BMJ and NHS. The advice when you give a doctor, doctor gives a prescription, you get physical activity on that prescription as well as just the drug, or whatever. And then there was the undergraduate curriculum and activating NHS system. So it's a very holistic, wide program led by the Department of Health, um, which has been renamed as the Office of Health and Improvement and Disparities and Sport England. Next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the evaluation. The physical activity clinical champions, they have managed to train up 16,000 healthcare professionals. Sometimes it's face-to-face, -face, but after COVID, much more likely to be um, online. And they would usually do it in that area. They'd know the people, they'd know the structure. And this place-based working has become a theme all the way through because you can't often do things nationally when there's so much local variation. Um, and the recognition of this was, was really strong. It's, you know, what I started perhaps doing in the 2012 with the Olympics then got really spread out. Next slide. And Moving Medicine was the website. And uh, if you want to look at it, because I haven't got it, it's movingmedicine.ac.uk. And that is a website which is trying to get you to understand it takes it almost from the, the evidence that we have to show how you build it into a conversation and how do you actually motivate people how do you motivate the patient to actually take on that lifestyle um, and it will actually then if you click on it you click on the age of the patient whether adult or child it then goes down to what their condition is it will then show have you got one minute have you got three minutes or have you got five minutes in the consultation and then it will guide you, if you've just got one minute, it will guide you how to do a one minute consultation about physical activity. Really brilliantly done. And um, as you can see, there are some very strong res responses. Next slide. Um, not surprising, 73% gave it 10 out of 10. And it's the way it does flow. And they've done it really with a lot of staff and, and, um, and patients as well. How do you actually, in a consultation where things are so busy, how do you actually manage to make this flow? Um, and then there's lots of printouts for patients to be able to back it up, um, which you can then give to the patient there and then. And it's tailored to that patient because of the age and the condition that they've got. Um, so that was very, very successful. Next slide. So this is the one I was more, more involved with as well. We put on the British Medical Journal, their e-learning program, which mostly doctors and healthcare professionals, not just in the UK, but around the world, go to. Um, and just in the UK, 30,000 of these modules were completed, uh, and a, probably a similar amount from overseas, an awful lot from India, um, the Middle East as well. Um, they're very short. They only take about 15, 20 minutes each, uh, nine of them all together, and they go through each condition. So it's physical activity and diabetes, physical activity and depression. Um, and what we found was that with these BMJ, 86% of people that started them finished them, which is always really reassuring. Um, with the NHS one, which was a slightly different group of people, it was about 43%. Next slide. And then the e-learning, which was done with the NHS, so these two sat side by side, was much more for the non medics really um, and that's again very successful and a lot of people enjoyed that next slide um 
But as we know, if we do everything individually, it doesn't get joined together. And there was another part of the Department of Health and NHS that looked at how to actually activate an NHS whole system right across from when a patient first sees the GP through to being referred to hospital, then having the operation if they have to, then being discharged from hospital and all the follow-up care. Have we got physical activity right the way through the whole system? And that was a lot of working together particularly in where you've got hospitals and the clinical champions working in primary care and, and the hospital care. Thank you. Next slide there. So the next thing I was going to do is just to say, um, you know, that was the moving healthcare professionals. It's continuing. It's still working. We're still learning. And that's going to develop to really embed physical activity. And now from about 8% of doctors knowing about what the guidance was, which was about a few years ago, naught when I started, it's now up to about 38 to 40%. So we're slowly moving it up the ladder. This was a game which we have done for my intelligent health hat to try and get an environment activated for physical activity. Um, so this supportive environment is a game. This is live in Leicester, this one. 39,000 people are playing it in Leicester from the most deprived communities. Next slide. And it's based on this principle that if you have stress because you're in a deprived community, your brain actually then tries to make you inactive to conserve calories. So that's based right back again as hunting gatherers. That reduces our resilience, which increases our stress, which causes more inactivity. And what we're trying to do is to break that bit there, be pressed again, and you break it there by making feel people they belong, they feel safe and they have purpose. And that immediately reduces the stress. And again, and there's something specifically for physical activity of trying to improve their self-esteem, their confidence of what they're doing and having a positive body image. So if we can start to do that, you press the game, sorry, it's a little, then you get physical activity. And again, I think reduces, increases resilience. That's right. And then you get the circle going around. So rather than just go in and try and talk about physical activity, we have to go upstream a little bit to that stress and try to break that um, cycle. Next slide. And this is where we've done it in Leicester. We activate the whole place by putting up little boxes on lampposts and giving people cards. And those people from the very deprived communities particularly, then start to activate themselves, looking at green space, know where they're going, talk, going to new um, leisure centres, community groups, walking groups. They start to set up the council, the NHS, they all start working together. Um, again, next slide there. And we've done it to about 1.7 million people and every time you get this about eight to nine percent increase in physical activity which then actually sustains for at least a year or two so it's how do you go in there to get the large numbers of people engaged using games makes it very non-judgmental and they enjoy it but we link it up with the nhs and then just on the last slide the sustainability of this is to actually find out what are the connections that have been made in the community to try and get more people active. And often there are lots of conversations by getting thousands of people out there and changing the culture and the environment. You start to get conversations between the council, the NHS, the active travel, the schools, the community groups, the volunteers, the sporting organisations, the nature and you get school tree planting, you've got active GP practices, you've got diabetes pilot. All of this starts to well up from the community by getting people to connect together. And that's what we're trying to do to get that environment um, right, to make it fertile ground. So when the GP does the consultation, the patient can go back into a community that's already started to become energised. Thanks very much indeed. Hey, William, um, a great presentation. Really interesting to hear about the um, the, 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 the uh, capacity building and, and training of health professionals and also that, that great example of Leicester um, with all the, the game and the activities. Um, so we've heard from all of our speakers. We've had our overview that our, um, uh, and also our national perspectives. Um, I can see that there's been some activity in the Q&A, but not questions per se. So if you do have any questions, um, please post them in the Q&A. Um, 
Meantime, perhaps, Kendra, um, I could pick up on something that you had mentioned where you were talking about um, that there are a lot of examples from the report from different countries. Um, does anything sort of leap out at you? We, we've we've seen some great examples already, but anything leap out at you of countries that have done sort of particularly well or spectacularly well or any kind of common themes between countries that that um, that are kind of markers of um, success that you would say? So a really good example came out of Wales, which is the National Exercise Referral Scheme. And that, I would say, probably its strongest component was its cross-sectoral collaboration as well as cross-departmental collaboration across uh, the government departments within the Wales government. And then it extended within national to more of the local community settings and then engagement of community partners to get these activities in place. And I would say of the good examples that we've seen, that typically is the l- most successful um, model that countries have followed where they have unsiloed themselves. And we all essentially are always working towards that same goal of we want better health outcomes, we want healthier communities, we want you know safer environments for adults and children alike. So if we start to break down these silos and work across Uh, these sectors, this is where we can see some really great advancements for everyone across the board um, for these improvements. So they did see that in Wales. Um, You can start to see how other countries are starting to build that up as well. Uh, In Portugal and in France, there's lots of really, really great examples in the report where we can see um, the majority of them were taken from European countries, uh, but we do have some examples from low and middle income countries as well throughout the report. Great, thanks, Kendra. And I know um, many countries are featured in the report, and it was more of a struggle to find kind of examples from low and middle income countries. Is, is there anything you can comment on in terms of sort of particular challenges around 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 that area, or anything that could be done to help um, address that? Yeah, I think that's it's really important to mention that the majority of examples did come from high income countries and reports, with some examples from low and middle income countries. Um, What we found actually was unfortunately a lot of information on policy development and progress in low and middle income countries were just not available publicly for us to include in the report. Um, But from some of the great literature that we found or interviews with some of the um, stakeholders or contributors to the report, uh, what we have found consistently is that considering the foundational policy processes that we've listed in the report will be beneficial for countries of all income types for the development of national programs to promote physical activity and primary health care. So that includes the consideration of context, equity, all of those pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Irene, perhaps if I could turn to you um, with your great example of, of Sweden. Um, how how long has has the um, has, has physical activity on prescription been available in, in Sweden? And was there were there any particular challenges in in was there a tipping point that convinced the government to to implement that as a policy? Uh, what 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 was the, the the success that actually made it happen? Mm. Uh, I think it's been stepwise, so uh, I don't remember exactly the year when it started, but there are some decades ago. Uh, and uh, it, w- when we see on, on lifestyle habits, uh, it, it's the most popular lifestyle habit to deal with in the healthcare sector. So I think health professionals are easiest to convince to, to deal with, uh, with the physical activity when you compare to, to eating habits and alcohol and smoking and so on. So, uh, so, so uh, and maybe it's the health promotion aspect that is uh, more popular to deal with than, than uh, uh, disease prevention. So um, that is maybe one aspect. Mm. Uh, and uh, the the current government, they have put uh, extra effort, uh, and uh, we usually don't have uh, uh, tasks to implement the special methods. So this is uh, rather uh, uh, rare uh, kind of, of uh, assignment that we have had this time. So uh, that reflects uh, the, the importance the, the government uh, puts on, on physical activity to, to promote uh, healthy lifestyles in the 
population. And uh, well, well, as in many other countries, we have problems with the scarce resources in, in the healthcare services. We lack uh, uh, medical doctors and uh, nurses in, in primary healthcare services, but also in, in uh, the hospitals. So uh, we need to, to prevent and promote uh, people to be even better to take care of their uh, own health and, and uh, to uh, support uh, physical activity is an easy way to make people to, to show some, a more uh, healthy lifestyle, I think. So, and, uh, but also previous government has given us tasks and, and also to the public health agency to deal with how to improve physical activity in the society. And there has been a special uh, task force dealing with, uh, with the promoting physical activity on a more uh, broader uh, way. So, so what we are dealing with now is the healthcare services, but uh, we need to, to involve all the society and, and many policy areas to promote uh, physical activity. So, so a lot of people are involved in, in this movement towards a more healthy lifestyle, a healthy population. Absolutely. Thank you, Warren. Um, I can see a question in the, in the chat from Avril. Um, when assessing the success of the physical activity interventions, which are the key markers that are used to measure this? Um, bear in mind, there'll be some difference to, differences depending on specific interventions. Um, William, is that something that you would want to weigh in on? Sort of um, measure, when measuring the success of physical activity interventions, um, it, how, how, do you, how do you measure success? It's a very good question. <laughs> it's a very, and it's really, really te taxed us. So the very old traditional way is that we've got the survey, Active Life Survey, and you see and there's a question every year, twice a year, on what's your physical activity levels, and it will take from children and adults. But it's very small sample in a very big group. And it's very, very, um, it's one specific part. And very often with physical activity promotion, um, as someone said a bit earlier, it's about getting the policies right. And it's about getting the, the narrative right. And it's about getting the, the culture right. Before you start to see if it's in the benefits of physical activity, it could be three or four years in advance. And I think the worry is that if you do too basic a metric at the beginning, you will fall flat because you won't actually have seen those changes take place. Um, so, you know, we call it kind of bats and balls. You can get a very quick response with an intervention, but when that intervention is taken away, the physical activity drops back again. Whereas if you change systems, then we do the system change, place based, you get the policies and cultures, and you've been working over years and years, like in Sweden, you know, you've got, you've got it built in that culture then you can start to see the benefits. So I think what you should do is measure the surrogate markers, which can be attitudes, knowledge, um, people working together, connections. Those are all count. And then eventually you will see that shift, hopefully towards physical activity change as well. But you also got to make sure it's the right people you're reaching. So you're not measuring those who are already active and say, great, it's the change from the most inactive and the deprived communities that you're really seeing where the benefit is. So it, it isn't straightforward, but certainly I think you know, something we've been really struggling with in the UK, with Sport England and getting that measurement, shifting away from that very binary physical activity not all the way through to this much more um, kind of you know, way of a wider way of measuring and stories as well and illustrations, all of those added into it. And from your experience, um, which you know is pretty broad and you've got a lot of experience over the years, what what do you find is are, are the biggest barriers um, for um, for GPs and other healthcare professionals who 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 want to incorporate physical activity into kind of a, a routine care? They don't believe they can do it. They think it's a waste of time. <laughs> they say, "Oh, I've tried that. I've been trying to get people more active for years. It doesn't work, so I've given up." And it's about obesity as well. They say that. So they they close their mind down to it. Plus, they don't quite get the evidence. They don't quite understand the you know what the new science about the neuroscience, particularly in the immunology. When you start to explain that, they get so much more energized and excited. And then you can look at about you know the um, going into doing very small changes of, of 
mentioning it for 30 seconds to a patient has benefit. We know that now. And the evidence is now showing that it really does work. You know, it's worked in Wales, it's worked in Sweden, it's worked in many countries. You can make a change. And when you give that evidence back to them, so they've now got a lever to pull, they've now got the knowledge, and they're hopefully much more incentivized, then you can start to build. And then, of course, you have to have the community infrastructure ready as well, because otherwise it will fall flat, there's nowhere to go. So it, it isn't straightforward, but certainly those barriers are, it's too difficult, therefore I'm giving up, is the commonest one that I come across. And, and once you've kind of had the conversation, like you were saying, um, you know, their, their eyes are opened and, um, you know, they, they start to get interested in physical activity, especially things like you're saying, you know, it's very doable to think about a one minute thing. Or, um, is there anything else you, or any other advice that you would give so, so, someone who's a health professional who's really interested, who, who does want to include physical activity? Is there any other advice you could give them in terms of simple things they could do? I think it's just keeping it, you always start where you are, where the patient is. So never don't go for 150 minutes straight away. You know, if a patient's doing nothing because they've recovered from a, you know, some difficult condition and they're very, very, un and they're very nervous about it, start from where they are. If it means getting up and walking to the kitchen four times a day, brilliant, start with that. If it means then walking around to the garden. So move to where they are, understand what their perception is of the worries. Many, and that's why Marines um, have done so much work good in Sweden, is saying actually it's safe for everyone to walk. There are very, very few, if any, contraindications now for very gentle exercise. In fact, there are none really for gentle exercise. So reassure them, build them up, and take your time. Don't expect it to happen overnight. It's going to take weeks and months, sometimes even a couple of years I've had in my experience before someone finally got the confidence to take it forward. Mm -hmm. So be in it for the, for the sort of long, the long term, the long game. Very much. Yeah, so... Okay, well, we're just about out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, really fantastic to have you. Thank you very much. And also um, our participants. Thank you for joining us. Um, you saw the QR code earlier in, in Kendra's slide. Hopefully you got a quick snap of that or a screen grab. But I think we do also have the um, the URL has been in the, um, the, the, the Q&A as well. Um, we'll also follow up with you um, uh, in the coming days with the, the link to this recording. And we'd really appreciate it if you could if you could share that with your networks um, because we want to get the report obviously out as widely as, as we can. Um, but I think that, that's everything. So yes, I hope you've enjoyed the, the, the webinar. Again, thank you very much for, for coming along and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.